open our Bibles to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter number 5. As we continue on here, in chapter number 3, we pointed out the fact that everybody had their place to serve and to work there in building the wall. And, you know, quite fascinating to see the different group of people that came together to accomplish one purpose. And uh, we reminded ourselves of what God has brought us together to do, uh, to reach this city and surrounding communities with the gospel of Christ. That's why he's gathered us together. And uh, just the, uh, the variety in the people. And I'm so thankful that God loves variety. I mean, you look out into this world and you see the variety in all kinds of creatures. Not all birds are the same, not all fish, not all trees, not all flowers. He loves variety and not all people are the same. And I'm thankful for that. God creates each of us very uniquely, very specially, and he equips us to do the job that he wants us to do. And quite fascinating to look and see the different places that these people worked It was near their home, or it had something to do with what they did, and and, uh, they were particularly equipped to do the job that they did. And then, of course, we noticed in chapter number 4 that once you begin to work for God, there's going to be opposition. And uh, this world and the devil is not going to like when we begin to do something for the Lord. As long as uh, we're sitting by and we're not doing anything, we're not reaching anyone, we're not discipling or encouraging anyone, the devil doesn't care what we're doing. He doesn't care about what you're wasting your life doing. But once you decide that you're going to do something for the Lord, he's going to take notice. And opposition came. And it was important that Nehemiah equip these people to defend themselves and yet to equip them also to continue to do the work. And uh, God has given us everything that we need to defend ourselves, to fight our spiritual enemy, because it's not a physical enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, the Bible tells us, but against principalities and powers and so on and so forth. It's a spiritual battle. And so he says you need to take on the armor of God. And uh, we have in the past gone through each one of those pieces of armor and noted their significance and importance and, of course, the weapons uh, to... Fight the enemy. And I love what it says in verse number 20, that last phrase in chapter number 4. says, our God shall fight for us. And uh, we reminded ourselves of that wonderful promise. If God be for us, who can be against us? I mean, this world is getting wickeder by the moment, it feels like. And the enemy is getting greater. The opposition is, is increasing. But that doesn't matter when we serve an almighty God. And uh, no enemy is too great for him. And so we also touched on the importance of prayer and watchfulness. And uh, it tells us in verse 23, So neither I, nor my brethren, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that everyone put them off for washing. And the significance there is that they were on guard night and day, watching and ready. They were sober. They were vigilant because they understood there was an enemy that wanted to devour them. And that's the way that you and I ought to be. Well, as we get into chapter number 5 here, we're going to see that the opposition goes from uh, being on the outside to being on the inside. We see that with uh, the church in the New Testament as well. There was an attack that would take place on the outside with the persecution and other things. And then we find that... uh, Things worked their way into the church, and there were problems inside the church. And uh, anytime you have people, there's going to be problems. Uh, There's going to be difficulties, disagreements, and so on and so forth. But it's important the way that we handle those things. And uh, the scripture details very clearly. That's not the direction we're going to go tonight and how we deal with those situations. Uh, But let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll, we'll get right in here. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, thankful for that song tonight that reminds us, uh, you know, what a pleasure to know that uh, we, if we've been to Calvary, that's what really matters, that we know the Lord and that He knows us. And uh, thankful for the relationship that we have with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, as we talked about tonight with David, or, or this morning with David and Mephibosheth. And now, Lord, as we turn our hearts to the book of Nehemiah, we pray that once again you would open up your word to us, 
Lord, that you would challenge us. I pray for those that may be here tonight without Jesus Christ as their Savior. God, I pray that their faith would not be in their own good works, not in church membership, baptism, or any other thing, not in a prayer that they've prayed. I pray their faith and trust would be in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection to save them from their sins. Because you've told us that's the only way to have our sins forgiven. That's the only way that we'll go to be with the Father is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray they'd be saved tonight. Lord, stir up our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's get in here. Nehemiah chapter number 5, verse number 1. And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. And so, as we mentioned last week, there was this attack that came from outside. Now there's going to be problems that arise from inside the congregation of those who are doing the work. And uh, you notice what the disturbance is all about beginning in verse number 2, and we'll read down to verse number 5 and see some of the problems that are taking place. It says, For there were that said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore we take up corn for them, that we may eat and live. Some also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses, that we might buy corn because of the dearth. There were also that said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute, and that upon our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brother, and our children as their children. And lo, we bring unto bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought unto bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. And so as they're trying to accomplish the work, there's some problems. Because they're having trouble with getting food. They're having trouble providing for their families. And and of course, it is vitally important that we provide for our families. Uh, The Bible says that if we don't provide for our own, we're worse than an infidel and we have denied the faith. And so it's important for us to do that. And somebody who truly loves their family wants to provide for them. I think of some of the most stressful times in my life were times where I wasn't sure how I was going to provide the next meal for my family, never mind pay the the mortgage and all of that sort of things, and and keep the light on. I mean, those are some stressful times. And they're under that stress. They want to work. They want to do the things of the Lord. And yet, uh, there's a problem because they, they need to eat. They need to provide for their families. And one of the issues that was going on, and we'll see this in just a moment, is those who were in leadership were taking advantage of the people that were underneath their direction. And so we've got a very big problem that is taking place here, and uh, Nehemiah is not going to stand for it. And uh, we we see some things reminiscent of uh, Acts chapter number 6. Let's turn over there, Acts chapter number 6. We'll look at a couple of different portions in the book of Acts tonight as we try to glean some things from what's going on in the book of Nehemiah and apply them to our own lives and our own walk with one another. Acts chapter number 6. Now for some of you this will be a very familiar portion of scripture. Uh, God is doing a great work here. Uh, people are being reached, and, uh, but there's problems. There's been persecution from the outside, and, and there's troubles that have taken place on the inside as well. And we'll see some of those. But uh, Acts chapter number 6, we read about some of the problems. In verse number 1, it says, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason uh, that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. 
Notice verse number 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And so you, you see a problem arises as some people feel like they're getting better treatment than others, and, and an issue with the widows there, and, and how important it is for us to take care of the poor and the needy. Uh, James reminds us of pure religion and undefiled before God is to take care of the widows and the orphans and uh, to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. So you've got this issue with the, the widows coming up. And uh, so the disciples get themselves together. And, you know, uh, God really, ble I believe, gave them a lot of wisdom in how to deal with the situation. And they said, listen, what we're doing is vitally important. Okay, so we're, God has ordained us to minister the word, to, to meet spiritual needs. And we can't leave off spiritual needs for physical needs. Physical needs are important. But they understood, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we, we need to take care of the spiritual needs. And so he said, let's take out these men here and uh, list seven of them for them and the, and the number of people that they had to deal with. We're going to take out seven men and gives the qualifications there, full of Holy Ghost, wisdom, who, may we, who we may appoint over this business. They're going to handle the physical needs so that the apostles can continue to meet the spiritual needs. And man, I'm so thankful for the, for the men that God has placed here, the deacons that we have, uh, to be able to help and to serve and meet the physical needs that we have here at Good News Baptist Church. Uh, they've been such a help and encouragement, a blessing to me so that I can continue to do what God has called me to do in meeting for the spiritual needs. But because they handled the situation correctly, uh, we find that God could bless the situation and could work in amongst what was taking place. And we read about verse number 7, how the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And man, what a what a... What a thing that was to have people turning away from a works religion to trusting in Jesus Christ by faith. But it happened because they handled the situation uh, correctly. And so we've got not too different of a situation that Nehemiah is dealing with. I mean, we've got people that have some real needs in what's taking place. And we're to a point where they say in verse number 5 that it, we don't have it in our power to redeem them. I mean, there's really nothing we can do to alleviate the problem in ourselves. We, we want to help. We want to do more. But we're, we're under such pressure. And uh, we get down to verse number 6. And the Bible says, And I was very angry when I heard their cry in these words. I really don't believe that the people were being vicious or malicious. I don't think they were really trying to cause up trouble. But... When Nehemiah hears what's going on and how these people are being taken advantage of, he, he's really upset. Uh, he is angry. And uh, he, you talk about their cry and he hears what's taking place. Verse number 7 says, Then I consulted with myself and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, Ye exact usury, every one of his brother. And I set a great assembly against them. You know, he, he's angry and upset. He does something that would, would be good for all of us to learn. He says, I'm angry, I'm upset, but he didn't just burst out immediately. And man, there's been times where I've done that, even about good things. And you just kind of burst out, you react, and that, that always causes problems. You know, there's been times I've had to go back to people in the church and say, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have spoken that way. I, I, shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have reacted that way. And uh, when we don't take time to, to process and to think about. That's why the Bible tells us we ought to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. And uh, yeah, there was a problem that's taking place here, but Nehemiah takes some time. And I love the way the Bible puts it here. I consulted with myself. You know, I, I stopped, thought about it. How do, you know, I can almost hear him having a conversation in his own mind. All right, what do we need to say? What do we need to do? I've had these conversations, not necessarily out loud, but in my mind. All right, what's the proper way to react here? What's the proper way to handle this situation? And man, there's been times where I've, I've 
had, peop- had to deal with situations with people where I, I've literally had to tell them, I, you know, I, I can't talk to you about this situation right now. You know, I'm going to have to go back. I'm going to have to think about this. I'm going to have to pray. I'm going to have to seek some counsel and then deal with this situation. And, and it's always a good thing to do. Whatever the relationship, whatever's going on, if we feel ourselves getting upset, even if it's over something that's right, as Nehemiah is doing, it's always good just, just take a step back. Remove yourself from the situation, whether you're dealing with your own children, your spouse, or whoever else. Take a step back, calm ourselves down, and, and think about what we're going to say, what's going on, what we should not say. And, uh, man, we learn a lot from, from the leadership style here uh, of Nehemiah. And there's some, some leaders that, that all they ever do is just blow up about everything. Some husbands, all they do is blow up about everything. Some, you know, parents, every little thing that comes up and they just blow up. Some pastors, they just blow up about every little thing. No, he said, just step back, let's, let's think about it. Nehemiah didn't just react. He didn't just blow up. He's angry, he's upset, and rightfully so. But he consults with himself. And uh, that would be a good lesson for all of us to learn. But you notice he doesn't skirt around the issue. There are times where we genuinely have to deal with situations. Uh, problems won't just go away on their own. If we believe that a problem is going to go on away on its own, it's just going to get worse. We've got to learn to deal with situations, but we want to learn to deal with it properly. And so he thought about what to say. And, uh, you know, Jesus told us there's a, there's a way to handle situations. If a brother be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. The Bible talks about speaking the truth in love. So we don't, we don't ignore what's taking place. We don't withhold the truth, but there's a proper way to communicate that. And anytime we're dealing with somebody, especially somebody who's, who's, who's in sin, our heart ought to be for the reconciliation of that brother or sister in Christ. Because that's what's good for them. That's what's best for them, is to get them from a place where God is correcting them to get them to a place where God can bless them. And if our heart's desire is not that they have a right relationship with God because it's what's best for them, then we need to let somebody else deal with the situation because we won't handle it properly. Um, but he, he, he confronts the issue. He says, I rebuked the nobles and the elders. And so he, he's not afraid to challenge uh, what's being taken... What's taking place here? Nehemiah is not one to just blindly follow leadership. And we shouldn't either. Yes, we ought to have a respect and a reverence. The Bible is very clear. There's a right way and a wrong way to confront leadership, especially spiritual authority. It doesn't say don't, but there's a right way. And uh, the Apostle Paul, he didn't just expect people to blindly follow him. He said, you follow me as I follow Christ. Basically, there's a line, you know, Hebrews 12 too, looking unto Jesus. I'm looking at Jesus, and as long as the person I'm following is in line with Jesus, hey, I'll follow you. But the minute you go off this way or you go off that way, I'm going to keep on following Jesus. I'm not going that way. I'm not going off this way. And so he, he... he confronts, and I believe he did it in the right way, knowing the character that he has had up to this point. But he deals with the situation. He says, ye exact usury, every one of his brother. And, and so as the congregation is, is together, and it says, and I set a great assembly against them, he puts some pressure on them to stop what they're doing and to do what's right. And that is the situation we find in how we're to deal with sin. He says, you know, you... You go yourself. If there is a problem, you go yourself. And, and you confront the situation. You know, if, if they get things taken care of at that point, hey, great. Nobody else needs to know about it. You, you've spared your brother. That relationship is restored. If they won't hear you, he says, you take a couple of witnesses. Two or three witnesses. If they hear them, great. Everything's restored. That's what we want. We want restoration. If they won't, then you take it to the church. 
We're going to put that pressure on people to turn around, do what's right, live a life that God can bless. And so the pressure is put on them to do what's right. We continue on, verse number 8. And I said unto them, We after our ability have redeemed our brethren the Jews which were sold unto the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren? Or shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace and found nothing to answer. So one of the things Nehemiah says, he says, Listen, one of the things that I've worked to do, and remember, he had a place of prominence. I mean, as the cupbearer, he was, he was the most trusted person in the kingdom. You better believe that with that came some, some importance, came some wealth as well. He says, I've used what I've been given to redeem my brethren, to redeem the children of Israel that had been sold into bondage, sold into slavery there in, in, under the Persian Empire that he was serving under. He said, I've done what I can do, and yet I come here, and you're selling your brethren uh, into bondage. And uh, you notice what it says in verse number 8. Then held they their peace and found nothing to answer. They didn't have anything to say. And I will give them credit for that because some people are confronted on, on the mistakes that they've made, the wrong that they've done, and, and man, they flare up and they defend themselves and they go on the offensive. And uh, you, can't, you can't talk to them about anything. You, you can't try to encourage them that, hey, you know, you may want to think about what you said here or what you did here, or this isn't right. They, you know, hopefully as a husband, you're not that way. Hopefully as a wife, you're not that way. You know, you can't make any mistakes. You can't do any wrong. You can't ever say you're sorry. Uh, some people are like that. So at least they, they don't fight back. They don't try to make excuses like Saul did. And we talked about King Saul a couple of weeks ago. He, he just made excuses for everything. It's everybody else's fault. It's the people's fault. It's Samuel's fault. It's God's fault. He continued. They, just, they didn't say anything. They knew there was nothing that they could answer. And uh, it shows, in my opinion, a little bit of remorse for what they've done. Also, I said, it is not good that ye do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? And uh, one of the things that Nehemiah encouraged these men to stop and do is, hey, think about, think about the opposition here. I mean, we're trying to, to rebuild the walls. We're trying to restore this place for our God. And, you know, think about the damage that you're doing. He says, you ought to live in such a way that shows your fear of God. You think about what we looked at with King David with his sin in Bathsheba. Nathan told him, you have given great occasion for the enemies to blaspheme God. And that's exactly what these people were doing. Because of the way that they were treating their brethren, those that they were entrusted to lead, Man, it gives them great, the enemy, great occasion to blaspheme. And, and we have this going on in our country today. Man, what a, what a shame that is. You hear about the, the crazy and the stupid and the evil things that people are doing in the name of Christianity. I mean, there's times where I'm ashamed to have Baptists on the, on the, the sign. Some of the things that take place. Now, I'm not going to take it off there because I believe in some things. But sometimes it's a shame when I hear about things that happen. I'm thinking, why in the world, of all, all, the, names, all the names on their church sign, why do it have to be Baptist? Why does it have to be that one? You know? And man, the, the hurtful and the harmful things that are done. I remember, it's been a few years ago now, I can't remember, I can't believe it's been 10 years already since we moved back to Iowa. And, uh, but like seven or eight years ago, there was a, a, a program on, I believe it was 2020. And uh, there was a situation with a very prominent Baptist church. And uh, so they were, 
interviewing some people and, and talking about just the, the mess that was going on and the cover-ups and all these sorts of things. And, you know, how heartbreaking. How heartbreaking that is. You think about the choices and the decisions. I mean, that's one of the things that weighs heavy on my heart, being a pastor of this church. So I've got to think about what I do. Even being a member of this church, you need to think about the way that you live your life because what we do does not just affect us. I mean, it, it affects your family. It affects the entire congregation. We don't want to give the enemy a reason to rejoice. We don't want to give the, our enemy a reason to blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ. And he says, you need to stop and you need to think about it. You need to walk in the fear of our God. And uh, it would be good for us to do a little bit of study about the fear of the Lord. We want to focus in on the fact that God is love. He is, and I'm thankful for that. But we can't ignore the other side of the coin. God is also a God who is just and holy. And He expects us to live that way. And uh, He says, I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn... I pray you, let us leave off this usury. And one of the things that he says here is he says, you know, at, at becoming governor, and we'll see that he became governor here in just a little bit. He was, he was made governor of this area. And so he could have, because of the position that he was given, he could have... Ex ex you know, exacted of them money and corn, as it says here. Um, but he didn't. He didn't. You know, I think of the Apostle Paul and what he said. He said, you know, it would have been all right for me uh, to take, take money from you, an offering and whatever else. The labor is worthy of his hire, as the Bible says. But uh, because of the situation, because of the false teachers that were taking advantage of people, he didn't want to be associated with that. So he said, I wouldn't take anything from any of you. Because he wanted the gospel to go forth without any hindrance. He didn't want anybody to be able to say, the only reason the Apostle Paul is doing that or preaching that or going there is because of money. He didn't want to do that. Not taking advantage of people. And uh, it's one of the things as a pastor I need to be careful of. I need to be mindful of. I try to be careful about what I say. Because people are so kind-hearted. I mean, you people are so kind-hearted. And uh, there's been times where I've just mentioned things in passing and people have done things that I, I wasn't expecting, I wasn't asking for, and I've got to be careful. And you know, one of the things that we have, we've had people with all of these uh, businesses uh, that want us to get on board and, and sell their business and whatever else and sign up with all of this stuff over the years. And uh, I just told my wife, I said, we, we won't ever do that. We won't ever do that. I'm not going to take advantage of the people that God has entrusted me with. Uh, because people will do things out of guilt. Um, and so we need to be careful. Unfortunately, there are those that do take advantage of people. Um, that's the situation that was taking place here. Not with Nehemiah. Nehemiah said, I could have. It would have been okay. He said, but I didn't want to. I wasn't going to be like those and take advantage of the people. And uh, he says, I pray you let us leave off this usury. We need to stop this behavior right now. Uh, quit charging interest on all of this stuff. He says, restore, I pray you to them, even this day. So this was a situation where he says, I want, I want this to be taken care of right now. And you think of Zacchaeus. And he came to know Jesus Christ as his Savior, and he, he repaid back. What, fourfold, I think it says, off the top of my head. He, he paid it back. He said, we need to stop this. Stop taking advantage. Stop cheating people. We're going to pay it back. And he says, I want you to restore it even this day. And, and when we know that we've done something wrong, and we've been confronted, the time to take care of it is that day. Don't put it off for tomorrow. 
Don't put it off for next week or the next time you see somebody, you know there's an issue and there's a problem. No, you, you do what you can do to, to rectify the situation as soon as you can. Um, he says, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, and their houses, also the hundredth part of the money and of the corn, the wine, the oil that ye exact of them. And so he, he says, I want, I want this taken care of right now. And he uh, talks about the interest that was incurred on some of these loans, the hundredth part there. And uh, we need to stop this. We need to stop taking advantage of one another. And you notice their response. Verse number 12. Then said they, we will restore them and will require nothing of them. So will we do as thou sayest. And so they're confronted, and I uh, give them a lot of credit here. You know, when they were confronted the first time, he, he, they, didn't, they didn't defend themselves, they didn't answer back. And, and now as he tells them, this is what I want you to do, they say, all right, we'll do it. You know, if this is the right thing to do, we're going to do it. And we need to be in the business of always doing what's right. You know, love that, that song, do right till the stars fall. And, uh, you know, it, it was the right thing to do. And they said, we will restore them. And we're not going to charge them interest and usury and all this stuff anymore. And uh, notice what he says, verse number 12. Then I called the priests and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. And one of the neat things about Nehemiah, he's so intelligent. I mean, he's so wise. Because sometimes people will just say things. They'll just tell you what they think you want to hear. And so just to rectify the situation, yeah, I'll do it, sure, yeah. Yeah, I'll take care of that. I'll pay them back. You know, I'll stop charging them usury and all of this stuff. And so he said, all right, if you really mean it, here's what we're going to do. Let's call the priest in. And uh, we're going we're gonna to take an oath. We're going to get serious about this thing. And uh, he says in verse uh, number 13, and, and it is a shame because he says that they should do according to this promise. Uh, you know, and it's, it's a reflection of the society that we live in as well. Because you just can't take people at their word anymore. And man, that, that's, that's so sad. You know, I hear about uh, some of the generations before me where man, just on a handshake, they would do business and they would hand out loans and, they, you know, they understood that if you said you were going to do something, you were going to do it. If you said you were going to pay this money back, then whatever it took, you were going to pay it back and, and those days are long gone. I mean, you can't take anybody's word for anything. You know, I, th this could be a rabbit trail that could go all night. I mean, there was a time when it, it meant something when you said, till death do us part. And even the most strongest bond that we have in our world today doesn't mean anything anymore. I mean, it is, it is a shame. But he said that they should do according to their promise. And, and what a challenge that is for us Christians. Let your yea be yea and your nay nay, as the scripture tells us. We ought to be a people of our word. He says, also I shook my lap and said, So God, shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise, even thus be he shaken out and emptied. All the congregation said, Amen, and praised the Lord, and the people did according to this promise. And so he, he uses an illustration here. And uh, we see throughout Scripture different times where an illustration is used. As, you know, Saul ripped Samuel's garment. He said, you know, the... The kingdom is rent from you just like that. And Ezekiel with all the different pictures that he was illustrating. And here Nehemiah, he shakes out uh, the corners of his robe. What we think of as our pockets, he shakes them out. And uh, he says, so God shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not his promise. If you don't keep your word, this is what's going to happen to you. We find a similar thing happening in the New Testament in Acts chapter number 18, verses 5 and 6. It says, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean 
from henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And a similar gesture with shaking the dust off of one's feet. Matthew 10, 14 and Acts 13, 51, we find those illustrations given. Uh, for time's sake, you can look those up on your own time. Uh, but he, he shakes off the garment there. And uh, he says, but notice what it says. They said, Amen and praise the Lord. And, and then it says, and the people did according to this promise. They kept their word. They did what they said they would do, and uh, what a wonderful thing. And sometimes we need to give people the opportunity to follow through, uh, to do what they said they would do. But he says, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year, even unto the 2 and 30th year of Artaxerxes the king, that is 12 years, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. And uh, one of the things that uh, was afforded to them because of the position underneath uh, Artaxerxes in Jerusalem was, of course, over their rule. They were given so much uh, uh, food and other things to, uh, to host dignitaries and all those sorts of things. And he said, not one time did I take advantage uh, of those things. He says, but the former governors that had been before me were chargeable unto the people and had taken of them bread and wine, besides forty shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people, but so did not I because of the fear of God. And so he didn't want to be a burden some to the people. He didn't want to take advantage of them. And uh, he wanted to be a help instead. He wanted to be a blessing. And he knows the motivation behind the way that he chose to live his life was because of the fear of God. And it wasn't just that Nehemiah told the people one thing and expected one thing from them and then he did another. I mean, he fleshed it out. He said, I, listen, I haven't taken advantage of the people when I could have. You shouldn't do that. You know, I didn't accept these things. I didn't put a burden on the people. You know, I, I, and you shouldn't either. And we need to be a people who don't just say one thing and do another. You know, I, I think that's the problem we have with a generation that's gone missing from the church. They've gotten tired of the hypocrisy. They've gotten tired of, this. Is, we live one way at church, we put one church face on at church, but when we go home, there's something else. It's time to take off those masks and be genuine. But uh, he says, I fear God, and that's the way... That's why I live the way I do. That's why I do what I do is because I have a fear of God. And that was one of the motivating factors and the drives for why he lived the way that he lived. Why he served how he served. And it ought to be for us as well. He says, Yea, also I continued in the work of this wall. Neither bought we any land, and all my servants were gathered thither unto the work. And... Uh, Nehemiah did his part as well. And his servants did their part. And he didn't take advantage of people. He didn't cause people to put up their land as collateral. He didn't purchase property uh, for his own advantage. He said, I'm here to do a job, and I'm going to do it. Moreover, there were at my table 150 of the Jews and rulers beside those that came unto us from among the heathen that are about us, now that which was prepared for me daily was one ox, six choice sheep, also fowls were prepared for me, and once in ten days store of all sorts of wine. Yet for all this required not I the bread of the governor, because the bondage was heavy upon this people. And one of the things that he says is, listen, I didn't put this burden on the people. I did what I did to try to be a help and a blessing. He paid for this all himself. He provided all this stuff himself. We ought to be a help to one another. We ought to be an encouragement. There's times where we are de desperately in need, and we need encouragement. We need help. Sometimes we need finances. We need somebody to be there for us in, in times of great sorrow and discouragement. There's times where we're desperately in need. There's times when we're not. And when we're not, we ought to be right there. Lending a hand, being an, uh, an encouragement, 
You know, as we have our handshaking time, as the services began and they end, what's the attitude you have? Do you have a heart to look around and find somebody that you can encourage in the things of the Lord? That you can be a help? Or do we have an attitude that it's just, just give me? That I'm just here so that you can give me something. I need the pastor to give me something. I need, you know, the songs to speak to me, to give me something. I need something. That's not the right reason to come together. There are times where we do need something. Don't get me wrong. And if we're in need, we ought to let people know. Hey, man, I'm struggling. I need encouragement. The temptation was strong this week. I need prayer. I need whatever. But we ought to have a heart to encourage one another. And uh, we think of Acts chapter number 2. Verse number 44 says, And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all man as every man had need. Acts 4, 34 says, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostle was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so here these early Christians were doing what they could do to be a help. There were needs that were taking place because of the persecution that they were under. So everybody did their part. Whatever I could do, that's what I did. If I could help somebody, I would help them. Of course, there were those that took advantage. You see in Acts chapter number 5 with Annas and Nias and Sapphira. They, they did it for the show, for the glory, for the self-exaltation. And they paid the price for it. We ought to be a people who are helpful, who are an encouragement. We ought to be a people that when other Christians see us coming, they're glad. And they're excited to see us because they know when they see us, we're going to encourage them. We're going to lift them up. We're going to help. And there's some people like that. Man, just even thinking about their name, seeing their face, just warms a spirit. Unfortunately, we got the other side of the coin as well. You just hear the name, you see the face, and you're like, oh, you, you brace yourself. What's the bad news now? How's the world ending today? I mean, we ought to be a people that are encouragement. But verse 19, he says, Think upon me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. And Nehemiah wasn't asking anything of the people but he asked God to remember him. And, and what we do for the Lord, we ought to do in secret. Other people don't need to know how we've been in help and encouragement to someone. We ought to just do it because we want to serve the Lord and we want to be a blessing. I think of Galatians chapter number 6, verse number 7. We usually stop a verse too soon. Verse 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And we usually stop right there. There's one more verse we need to pay attention to, and I think it will be beneficial for us tonight. Remember, he said, in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And he continues on. He says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. He said, we ought to be looking for ways we can do good for people. We ought to be looking for ways that we can be a help and an encouragement with the things that we say, with our actions, what we do. He says you ought to be looking for those ways, knowing that we'll receive our reward from God, not from men. We ought to be looking for God to reward us, not for men. And here we have a people, they were looking to be rewarded from men, and they were going to do whatever it took to be rewarded from men. Nehemiah said, no, that's not the way we ought to do things, especially not with our brethren. And as a church, that's not what we ought to do. 
we ought to be looking for opportunities to do good to all men. He says, especially those who are of the household of faith. So let's look for opportunities to do good for one another this week. 